Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode two of ASMP Experts and Masters. Uh, my name is Luke Copping. I'm an editorial and commercial photographer from Buffalo, New York. I'm also the chairman of the National Board of Directors of ASMP. This is my co-host, Tom Kennedy. Hi, I'm Tom Kennedy, executive director of the American Society of Media Photographers and a former director of photography at National Geographic and multimedia editor at The Washington Post. And we're going to be talking to Alyssa Meadows today. Alyssa is a volunteer for ASMP New York, as well as uh, a volunteer for the Young Photographers Alliance. And we're going to be talking today about her experiences working with YPA, her experiences being a young photographer emerging into the market. Uh, but first, I want to thank Photo Brigade and Robert Kaplan for helping us put this on. And I want to thank Adorama for letting us use their learning center space where we're uh, doing this broadcast from today. So I'm going to turn it over to Doug and Alyssa, and uh, to, to uh, Tom and Alyssa. <laughs> And, uh, and we can get started. Okay, thank you. Alyssa is the mentorship manager for the Young Photographers Alliance, and I really wanted to bring her on as a guest to talk about her experiences with the YPA, but also just her sense of community. I think as a young photographer, you know, moving into the New York scene and finding your place in that world, you've got a lot to talk about in terms of how community is helping you and how you're committed to community in this, at the same time. So why don't we start with how you, how you found yourself into YPA in the first place as a mentee and you know, where, you know, what that experience was like for you. Well, it's actually funny because ASMP is actually where I started and how I found YPA because I had um, a college professor doing a, co a portfolio prep course as like the senior thesis class. And um, his name's Lonnie Graham, and he had it a requirement to be a student member of ASMP. Like, it was just a flat part of, you know, if you wanted to pass the class, you had to be an ASMP member. And I kept it on after I graduated because, it, you know, I was recognizing the value of it. I moved down to Philly, and I was in the Philly chapter. And then when I moved up to New York, um, I think it was through a, an ASMP email that actually was promoting the YPA program. And so I applied to it, and then it just kind of steamrolled from there. And tell me a little bit about what the process was like to get, you know, for you to get started and, and how you found your mentor and what you were hoping to get accomplished by having a mentor. Well, the nice thing about the program is it already has really established photographers as mentors, so it wasn't so much looking for a mentor as it was making sure the application was strong for the program. Mm -hmm. And basically, I had Andrew Hetherington and Steve Geralt as my mentors. There were five of us. Um, that were in the in the New York chapter program, and you know the whole course of the process the process is you're working on a project, and it's nice because it's kind of a stepping stone from being in college and you know that scholastic environment to being in the real world, and you're working very closely with those two mentors as they're helping you develop the project, and you're working with your you know fellow mentees and talking about what's working and what's not working and how to approach the real world challenges of getting gear and getting space and getting models and the releases and all that kind of stuff that you don't really have to worry about in school because it's provided. Right, right. And what, what was the time frame for your initial mentor, menteeship? Um, it was from about June until September. I mean, it really ended in August, but then we were doing PR stuff that pushed into mm -hmm. September. And then the exhibition for all of the mentees in all the cities was in February. So... But we've all, you know, I just went to Taiwan a couple months ago for the wedding of one of the mentees that was in my group. Like we've, like that's what's really nice about the program when, when we were in it was I'm still, you know, I have a going away party tonight for the one girl. She's moving to San Francisco. Congrats, Missy. <laughs> and, you know, Singh is here in New York, but, you know, we're, we're still really good friends. And our other friend, Andrew, you know, he's still working in the industry. He right. assists for Joe McNally. And we still, we don't get to see each other as much as we'd like, but, you know, we're all still very well connected. Yeah, I mean, that's really compelling to me because I've had similar experiences through various organizations, both ASMP, but also, you know, I've attended workshops in the past where I've stayed very closely in touch with the people I met there and formed our own communities. I've done workshops in the past with John Keatley or Joe Pugliese and made really important connections, friendships. Um, people I rely on both, you know, spiritually as, as friends, but also professionally as resources for myself. And I think that's something that's really interesting in the photography industry right now because people are coming to this industry from more routes than ever. It's not necessarily people just assisting or just going to school. People are coming to photography as a second career. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk about emerging photographers and people have this uh, concept that it's someone young. I, I know a lot of people that are entering photography for the first time as a profession in, in middle age or even in their uh, later years. And it's really interesting the 
methods they're taking to get there, be it that they're self-taught through resources online or through mentorships like YPA or workshops or um, you know, online learning platforms like Creative Live. And so it's interesting to see how those communities get formed when they aren't structured in the traditional method of like an art school or like mm -hmm. people you meet just assisting as you get, you know, apprentice yourself to another photographer. Yeah, it's been, um, I mean, that's where ASMP has been kind of really valuable because, I mean, there's a lot of subgroups within it, but I've made a lot of really valuable, like I would say it's more like a photo family than mm -hmm. a photo, you know, anything else. It's like they're coworkers. We work together on a lot of things. Like I'll assist for, like Tom and I have assisted together and, you know, it, there's a lot of overlap, but at the end of the day, it's also, you know, two photographers live like three blocks away and they'll watch my cats, I'll watch their cats. Right. <laughs> you know, it's, we've got so much community that we don't know what to do with it almost, which is nice, because yeah. it's, when I have a problem, like I called three people this morning when, you know, things break, things go wrong, suddenly your lens isn't firing or your, or your flash isn't firing or your lens isn't focusing and you have to, you know, jump quick and, when you have those resources, those moments aren't so scary because you have that backup. You can be like, oh, my card's not reading. What do I do? Let me call my friend Steve and see what, what he has as a suggestion for a solution. Yeah, it's kind of nice how it breaks down that conception a lot of people have as photographers, especially a lot of us being independent business people and entrepreneurs as being kind of these insular nomadic people. You know, we're working on a shoot or we're working in our home offices. and. You know, what's our community? But I think for people like you and me that have experienced the vibrance of that community and relied on it as a resource, not just to get started in our careers, but to continue building it, it's it's really eye-opening how important it is to us. I, I, I can't think about where I would be in my business today if I didn't have the mentorship and community that I, I had coming up. I, I graduated from art school, but I left the industry for many years from burnout, and it was really mentors and, and friends in the industry who helped me come back to photography. Uh, and that helped me find uh, being able to make a living doing it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I don't want to, you know, make it sound like all we do is socialize because certainly we fall into our photo caves. Everybody has them. But that's where, you know, belonging to the, the community is nice because, you know, we'll have a networking event or an educational workshop or a presentation. Like I just went to projections a couple nights ago and I got to see some of my good friends new work and we we get to experience what other people are working on, which I think is really important in influencing our own work because you just exist in a vacuum you're never going to grow and I know for myself that you know every photographer goes through rough times there are times where work is slow or you get laid off or things just aren't going your way and I know if I hadn't been in the community the way I was I don't think I would have made it through my own I've gone through two of them that were you know am I going to have to leave the city can I stay here can I make this work and ASMP was definitely a major part of how I was able to make it work because I wouldn't say 70 to 90 percent of the work I get is through referrals that connect back to these communities in one right. way or another. Right. So, so when when you were, you know, when as you were finalizing your project that you did when you were a mentee, did it change how you thought you were going to enter the business, or did it affect you in any kind of profound way that way that you got new insights as a result of going through that experience that you might not have had coming out of school without it? Um, I think Andrew and Steve spent one whole session because it was like six to eight sessions at like two to three hours a piece. Mm -hmm. And there was one day that Andrew and Steve really focused heavily on the concept of personal projects. Like they took the time. Andrew showed us, you know, what he'd been working on back home because he's from Ireland. And Steve was showing us the cookbook he'd been developing because, you know, he's really into food. And they were really impressing upon us that that's what was getting them work. Like you can do the commercial gigs and you can get the work done and have that on your website as a, as a pitch piece, but that the personal work, because it means so much more to you and you're so much more engaged with it, that usually it just is a lot stronger because you're so much more invested and those are the jobs that usually stand out to photo editors and creative directors and art buyers that make them want to hire you for commercial work. So I think that was a really big turning point because it felt it changed it from feeling like I couldn't work on my own work because I needed to be focusing more on getting like the, the real gigs to being like, no, this isn't a, a worthwhile investment of my time because even though this project is just for me or just for the people participating, it will highlight my, my talents and my skills in another way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's, talking about mentorship is interesting because it gets us on the topic of stewardship. How can established photographers help guide younger members of the community or those entering the career for the first time into you know, positive experiences, having 
a good education, have, being you know involved in this industry. And I know we've both been lucky enough to have really great mentors, but I know we've talked also about experiences we've had in the past that weren't necessarily the most positive. And, you know, I'd love for you to share some of your experiences and I can share some of mine, but I'd also love to talk about what you think makes a good mentor. How should photographers be cognizant about how they're passing knowledge on to the next generation of photographers and how can they ensure that they're prepared and armed and educated enough to have sustainable careers in this business? I think the two biggest things are being willing to be open. I think a lot of photographers treat it like there are these deep, dark secrets and I figured out this trick or that you know tip to get work and they don't they hold on to those kind of things and that inhibits everybody because when that openness is there then you know how you should be bidding and how you should be pricing and like what license how the licensing works you know a lot of you know kids out of school unfortunately photo school in general doesn't seem to teach right. that side of the industry as much like I didn't know what photo assisting was when I graduated college and I think that's kind of a big problem <laughs> so you know I think it's important to have that willingness to embrace the younger community instead of seeing it as a threat because I think because it's such a competitive industry a lot of people are just like I need to get the work and it's like by making sure the younger generation knows how to price properly and how to treat jobs responsibly and maintains that decorum within the industry then it just strengthens everybody's business essentially. When we in our last episode just had Doug Menuey on, Doug talked at length about how fear affects someone's viewpoint. And do you think um, fear is a factor that a lot of photographers contend with when they look at possibly mentoring someone? I can't speak to the mentor side of it, but I know as, a, as someone who's looked for mentorship, fear is definitely a contributing factor. I mean, to go back to your other question about bad experiences, I had a photographer, very successful photographer, in, and when I was in Philly, he told me I shouldn't come to New York. He told me there was nothing for me in New York, I wouldn't cut it, I wouldn't make it, my work wasn't good enough, and that I was a bunny rabbit that would get eaten by the tigers. And, you know, that could have scared a lot of people off, and, and that's one thing that I think is really important in mentorship, is like you have to have the right mentality about it. You have to want to help them grow, not just squash them. Like there's a place for constructive criticism, and it serves a lot of value to to help you develop as an artist and a creative, but you also need to be supportive. Like when I'm doing portfolio reviews, it's always, well, you could do this better, or this could be a little stronger, but you did this really well. <laughs> like, if you end on that that positive note, it, it makes them know that they don't suck, they need to just do better, and they're, you're always able to do better. No matter how good you get, you can always do better. Yeah, so. I, I, I have a similar experience that really mirrors that, and unfortunately, like I kind of gave into it. I, uh, my first assisting job out of college, I worked for a photographer who was very adamant that the industry was going nowhere, that I was going nowhere, that my work wasn't up to par, and unfortunately, that was a big contributing factor in me giving up on photography for a while, and I spent a couple years working in a factory before I picked the camera up again, and in retrospect, I really wish that I had just gotten and pass that adversity and pushed through it, I think that would have gotten me off on the right foot with my career a lot quicker. And I've seen photographers, um, both people that I grew up assisting with and people that are kind of are coming to me now to assist, and I've seen them have these really kind of uh, unpleasant experiences that seem based around like the fear of other photographers or like this, this overly competitive nature that uh, seems to be really rampant in some aspects of this industry. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, that's where, the, the nice part is I found the people that tend to be that way don't tend to gravitate to the community-based situations, which is nice, because then all the people that want to help each other grow and want to support each other as artists are all kind of in the same place. And the people who want to lone wolf it and be that hyper-competitive, you know, they're on their own, and I'm sure some of them are really, you know, killing it, but they're, yeah. they're missing that really nice component of your, your photo work can also be your, your family and your friends, and it can be so much more fulfilling when you don't treat it like this cutthroat industry. I know another aspect of, you know, that I think signifies your work is your social consciousness and the fact that you've chosen to do some projects that we're showing on the screen now that um, reflect not only the reality of contemporary culture and politics, but also your own interests. Can you talk a little bit about that? in terms of how you know how you came to that consciousness and you know what you're trying to do with your own photography that way well i mean i always had two passions they were always separate but one was you know feminism and intersectional feminism especially and photography but it was always a struggle to figure out how to merge them so they just kind of lived independently for a really long time I'm obviously very upset about a lot of the things that are happening right now, right, right. but if i had to say there was a silver lining which even feels not the right way to phrase it but right 
when he got elected, suddenly everything just clicked. And then it was fusion of ideas of how to, you know, when we have somebody who is accused of what he's doing in office, <laughs> it's, um, it feels a lot more pressing and a lot more urgent to, to find ways to communicate these problems and, and address them in a more substantial way. So talk about what you did, used as a jumping off point for that kind of um, project. Well, the nice part is it kind of, the whole project, I mean, the one on screen right now is right. Every Woman I Know, which is a project I'm doing that I've been working on for the last year where I'm trying to photograph every woman I know that's been a victim of sexual violence, whether that's assault or rape, or, you know, anywhere within that spectrum. If they've had an experience, they qualify. And the whole reason it came about is actually because of ASMP, because at at an ASMP party, Tom introduced me to Tony Gale, who's the APA national president, and he started a women in photography group that me and a few other girls belong to. And then he got Sony to sponsor us with cameras for a month to work on a personal project. That's how this all came about. So it, it ties mm -hmm. right back into that community thing at the same time, because I don't know if I would have felt brave enough or confident enough to work on it if I didn't have... Tony and Allie and Charlene all telling me, this is a great project, you need to do this, this sounds amazing, you have to. And so then I started it, and even in the process of doing it, I had three different photographer friends, Ryan, Lee Beckett, Ken Jones, they all lent me their studio space when I needed it, and Cliff from Pro Photo gave right. me lights for a month. Like, you know, he just was really, I owe Cliff big time for that one, because he just lent me a whole, you know, huge Pelican case of gear and was like, just give it back to me at the end of April and we'll be good. <laughs> like, so that that all came about because of that support and that encouragement from the community. And how are you, you how, what are you doing now to get the word out about the project and, and get people in, engaged with the imagery? I'm actually presenting it at projections next month, so I'm hoping there will be some, some pick up from that mm -hmm. too. But basically I'm just trying to get the work out there. I'm just trying to get as much of the work done as I can because I photographed 14 women so far, but I found 35 at this point, and that's only of the 50 that answered me. So <laughs> I originally reached out to 200 and I haven't even tackled my whole network at all. I just was going, you know, Facebook mm -hmm. friends, college, high school, people that I could easily access and get quick responses from. And, you know, I need to encapsulate the larger group a lot more. So there's a lot of work to do with it still. And are you surprised at the willingness of women to step forward and engage with you on this as, as the subjects of your photography? I am and I'm not because, because I've always been so outspoken with my own feminism. I think it's like pretty much a blanket statement. If you want to come to somebody with something of that nature, I'm the person to go to. Like I'm going to know how to talk to you about it and how to handle it and how to help you work through it. Um, but I am surprised by how many women have done the public portrait because basically the way I structure it is everyone's photographed anonymously so that, you know, a lot of them are fine with the general, their circle knows, like their family, their friends, people know, but that's not the same thing as letting the whole right. wide world know. Right. So I did it as anonymous for everyone and then those that opt in to have the public portrait get photographed both ways because I figured that would also help the project additionally because it'll show this is how many women are willing to come forward and this is how many still don't feel safe being identified even though there is the safety in numbers and there is the power in many voices they still feel like this is still a risk to them to even be identified as a victim so that was um a nice surprise because nine of the 14 have done public portraits so far outside of the original scope of your project which was primarily women that you knew i mean this seems like something that has there been any interest in like this growing into a larger movement? Have you gotten interest from other people who've asked about participating? Well, that's my whole, everybody I talk to and show the project to is always like, I know somebody who, and I'm like, I need to know them. I need to sit down with them. I need to get coffee. But my ultimate plan is to have it be, I make the lighting design public and let other photographers photograph it and make a secondary tier. I want to make a whole separate website for it because right now it just lives on my website and I've just been working with the people I know, but I want to make it that it's like an open submission of sorts to let that grander network be seen of how many women yeah. deal with this on a regular basis. It just makes me think back to what we were talking about with Doug Menuhay just a few hours ago and this notion of like creating these platforms as photographers maybe outside of the realm of traditional publishing that allow us to really be the leaders of our own movements, whether it's in Doug's case is documenting the rise of the tech industry and how new upcoming entrepreneurs are moving into that. And yours is certainly a, a very socially conscious um, version of, the, of that in terms of documenting this. But mm -hmm. I think there's a, a lot to be said in terms of, I can see a lot 
lot of similarities between how this could be structured in a similar way to what Doug is talking about that really could turn this into a much larger um, movement and tribe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I mean, my whole intention is to ultimately make a book that I can sell for nonprofit purposes to raise money for, for victims of domestic violence. And Frank Mayo has been hugely helpful in advising me on how to you know, approach the project because in addition to the photos, I have questionnaires, I have handwritten stories, I'm getting audio. So there's a lot of material to work with and figuring out how to you know, classify it all together and figure out what works where and how to present such a multifaceted issue. Cause Every woman's story in this project is different. Like some have been, you know, it's been a mild groping. Others, it's been she wasn't attacked, but the boy was bothering her, and then he attacked her sister, and her sister was the victim. Or it's their father, or their cousin, or, you know, their college friend. So everybody's had a very different story, and I think it's really important to address the variety and make sure that people are aware it's not just some back alley attack that women usually face. Mm -hmm. I think it's such a critical project at this point in time, given the obviously the pol political dynamics in play in a lot of places. Um, what's your? Do you think this will fundamentally change how the subject of sexual violence against women is viewed and talked about, so that it um, women are empowered to overcome the experience that they've been subjected to? Yeah, I think it's definitely, I mean, the last, I mean, I started this project a year ago. I started it, I, I conceptualized it last January, shot the majority of it last April, and then have been editing and working on finding more people and figuring out where it's been going since then. And then the Me Too stuff happened, and the Time's Up stuff happened, and now the Aziz and Sorry. Like, there's definitely been a shift, and the conversation is, is growing substantially, I think. So it's, it's mostly just... There's, there's a book I read called The Mother of All Things, and basically the underlying concept is that silence is how all of these things are maintained. Right. Um, and it's kind of the building block for all of these prejudices, whether it's racism, sexism, ableism, whatever it is. You know, silencing those voices is how it's maintained. And so it was nice. I read the book after I started the project and realized that that's how this project is actually fighting the problem. And I think a lot of different groups and organizations are embracing that concept of, like, we're not going to be quiet about it anymore because that's how this perpetuates. Right. I mean, I, I'm obviously, I, I live outside of Washington, D.C., and I'm very involved in advocating for ASMP on p political issues, and I'm very intrigued by seeing the rise of women, for example, running for office this year, as a, mm -hmm. you know, I think it was as a result and a reaction, you know, in a completely different way. Well, I mean, even the, the, I forget her name, I feel awful that I can't think of it right now, but the trans woman who beat the... Dana Rome. Yeah, mm -hmm. like just the fact that she went in and took out her opposer who was so negative and critical and, mm -hmm. you know, ripping her character to shreds, and she just, you know, yeah. the fact that she took him out, I think shows a lot of where we're headed and where people are realizing that it's not okay to just say those kind of things and be that yeah. of that mindset. Yeah, and it's a very current issue for us even in our industry. Just in the last year, we've had a lot of conversations about uh, the, the visibility of uh, female photojournalists and female photographers in general and bias in editing and assignment um, distribution, stuff like that. And so it's great to see amazing photographers like you on the rise because I think these stories need to be more visible and I think mm -hmm. uh, a big thing that ASMP is becoming more cognizant of is the need to help share um, work by our members that's socially conscious and relevant to the times we live in. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, pivoting away from the work for a second though I'd love to talk a little bit more about um, YPA and some of the um, some of the benefits that you got. like obviously you've grown into this incredible socially conscious photographer um, who's really connected your disparate interests in a way that's created this amazing kind of journalistic body of work. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about how YPA actually works for young photographers coming into it. Like, what's the general structure? How does it work? How can we help make uh, the services of YPA more available to young photographers, especially young photographers who have stories like this to tell? Well, that's what's really nice about yeah, YPA because the, the theme, I mean, there's the organization and then there's the summer mentorship program. And, you know, in the past, the, the organization had a lot more of other events going on. Like Steve Geralt, my mentor, he was doing workshops every month. Like, this is how you do environmental portrait lighting. And this is how you shoot for st still life. And, you know, he had a night where Michael Ash came in and did portfolio reviews of, like, just send us your website and we'll pull it up and let Michael say what's working and what's not. And so there were a lot of great workshops of that nature. 
but the summer mentorship program is what we're really focused on bringing back this year because we're 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 building steam back up and we're trying to redevelop that community because we used to be in a lot more cities now we're aiming for six to eight cities this year as we're rebuilding you know everybody's you know the industry's just been tough on a lot of people so we're in that process and it has a lot of educational purposes throughout because it's teaching you it's one is giving you access to a lot of the things like photo plus expo they took us to visual connections um steve and andrew brought in amy wolf from pdn when she was there to look at her work and we got on photo plus or pdn's photo of the day so there were a lot of opportunities to get the work out there and and learn from the process of it like how to connect we'd never said i'd never sat down with a photo editor before and then amy's there and someone from pdn it's like this is huge and telling us how to talk about our work and how to get in touch with photo editors and how to pitch yourself when you do and what makes you stand out and those kind of things. So it had a lot of benefits in that respect, but in addition just that the support is always there. You know, the, the organization follows up with its mentees, like we have a where are they now, and a lot of our mentees have been doing some really amazing things post, post-graduate. Like Singh just had work in Seoul, South Korea, like her photo is on the outside of a museum, like 20 by 30 feet, it's huge. It's an, it's, you know her project from from the program so it's amazing to see how strong the talent is and how they develop and and that we continue to support them because yeah. there's been scholarships and all sorts of things so so we talk a lot at ASMP about the photography industry being an industry that's constantly in flux since you went through the YPA program what changes have you seen in the industry from a business perspective that have really you think have even changed since you were in YPA that you think people emerging into the industry now should be cognizant of that's a tough one <laughs> I know that's why we ask the tough questions in this uh, segment this, in, now in these we're episodes. done with the easy stuff yeah yeah exactly <laughs> um, I think I think because there's such an influx even just the last couple of years with social media like I think a lot of kids don't know how to price they don't know you know everybody it's becoming such a gig economy I feel like, I mean, I noticed big clients are doing this third party. Like, I think I emailed you about yes, with, you did. with Flash Stock yep. when they were, you know, big clients that would normally be twenty, thirty thousand dollars campaigns. They're giving you like eight hundred dollar budget. And it's like, where's the rest of that money disappearing to? Like, are you keeping it as the third party middleman person or are you just diluting the value of the work in general? So I think that's something that's going to have to be contended with. I think it's mm-hmm. coming to a head. It's going to implode at some point. So. Yeah, and, and Tom and I have had many discussions over the months about various services emerging that, you know, are seeking to disrupt the traditional models of photography, but not necessarily in a positive way. I know we had conversations recently about um, services like Image Brief and Kodak It and, right. and things like that, that were really, really relying on moving photography services towards that gig economy model in a way that it wasn't necessarily great for photographers from a business standpoint, things that really destabilized like the value of assignments and really changed perceptions about the value of imagery, both as a tool for advertising and dissemination of ideas, but also in terms of like journalism and uh, writing certainly much more like um, societal critique purposes. Mm-hmm. I think one of, the, one of the things that has struck me is that without sufficient education, young people are really subject to being preyed upon by um, people who are really trying to devalue the work that they do and, and utilize it in ways that I think are, are pricing at least for it in an unhelpful way. How do you think that YPA helps protect against that kind of exploitation? I think because it's bringing them into this community from the start. Like, I mean, I could have not been in ASMP and not been in YPA and found this all out the hard way over the next decade. But because I was in this consolidated program and, you know, exposed to all of these more experienced photographers from an early, you know, standpoint, that I kind of expedited that whole process and learned how the gig works a lot faster. Right. And that translates into keeping it healthier because I'm not I I learned very quickly I was underpricing myself for certain jobs and I wasn't giving myself enough credit as a photo assistant and that I should be charging higher rates and all those kind of things translated into getting through that growth period a lot quicker essentially (laughs) another thing that I've been struck about reading you know reading about you and getting to know you is your 
I guess for lack of a better way of saying it, your ethic of volunteerism and your commitment to doing it. Can you talk a little bit about what you derive as a result of being a volunteer for SMP and YPA and, and, and sort of how you think about that as part of your overarching career plan and how it fits in with your own photography? Honestly, I view it as an investment of my time because one, it's, you know, if the, if the industry is not strong, it doesn't matter how good I am. There's not going to be anything for me to stand on. So it, it helps everybody in that respect. But then also, of course, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, but the, you know, the, the strength of that industry is so critical to maintain, and you're constantly trying to work with it. Ask me again, please. Well, I guess what I'm wondering about is just sort of how it. you view, how you balance your volunteerism yes. okay. with your with own me. career. Yeah, well, I mean, it is definitely a huge time investment. I mean, I think I'm one of the board members running the most events this year, just saying. <laughs> but honestly, I think it's a really great thing, and I choose the events that really fit with what I want to be doing, too, because, you know, I was the last... 2014 was the last year of the mentorship program before it took a pause point and I picked it back up and we brought it back. So I, I've been doing the student portfolio review with ASMP with the intention of inviting the white PA students and making sure they know that that's there for them because a lot of the mentor or members in ASMP aren't students. So they, even though we have a student portfolio review, we have to figure out how to access them and give them that information. And if they're sitting down earlier getting better and more constructive feedback sooner, then they're getting better earlier and learning faster. And it just translates into, you know, I just am a strong believer in if you benefited from something, recognize that benefit and give back. And that's where being on the board and running YPA this year is really, really critical. Well, the mentorship program this year is really right. critical. From your perspective, being involved in YPA, what can organizations like ASMP and other photo trade associations do better to serve younger members? I mean, what what can they do better? Right. Yeah. You tell us what we're messing up. What can we do to, to be more relevant for you guys? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've kind of been tackling that a little bit because <laughs> I I, right. I was noticing gap in educational workshop. Like we have a lot of workshops all the time, you know, whether it's lectures, seminars, hands-on educational things, and we were missing a lot of you know emerging stuff. So it was I did an assistant intensive workshop. We're now planning a Digitech workshop. Um, Frank Mayo is doing a portfolio, not a portfolio, he's doing um, a photo workshop all day for, I mean, that's for all members, but I think it's particularly valuable for emerging professionals because Frank is throwing a bunch of information at you, like very condensed, but also very concise, like very valuable. And, you know, it's not filled with fluff. He's giving you, this is what you need to do. And so it translates really well into helping facilitate that. So I think supporting those kind of events are critical, making sure we're having those educational resources available, and then just supporting the programs that are there, you know, whether that's, I mean, YPA is doing crowdfunding next month on GoFundMe, and we're hoping to get a lot of support, because if if the support for the community is there, then it just will, it'll help everybody inevitably. <laughs> Especially when you look online, there's a, a division um, there's people who think this industry is in decline. There's a lot of doom and gloom. There's a lot of worry. And, mm -hmm. and frankly, some people, you know, have businesses have changed. The, the business models have altered. People need to be adaptable. But where do you find yourself on that side? Are you worried about the state of the industry? Or do you find yourself hopeful about the opportunities that new technology and, and uh, emerging business models have for young photographers? I mean, I think it's hard not to worry. There's always that month where you're like, where's the work? Why is no one calling me? What's happening? <laughs> and like, I know a lot of people were feeling it this January. It was slow for a lot of people. But I think it's, I mean, obviously the image is just getting more powerful. Like Instagram, Snap, Nat, you know, Snapchat, social media, all of these things are just growing exponentially. And the, the desire for images is not going away. Like even with the virtual reality and the video, like I just was hired to do video and photo last night. So, you know, I don't think it's going anywhere. It's more making sure that it's affordable to be one because if we can't get the rates where they should be, then you can't invest in your business and your equipment and making sure that you can do the job appropriately. And how can so, we be better as an industry about doing that? I think part of it is being firm. And I think that that's why I'm such a strong believer in, in you know, everybody bitches and moans, sorry, <laughs> complains about how students are, 
you know, diluting the industry. They're not pricing appropriately. Somebody's doing that gig for $400 when it's an $800 job. And that's why it's important to teach them so that they know how to do that and so that it doesn't get diluted. And, and fighting, I mean, a lot of what National is doing, like fighting the Time Inc. contract, like that contract. I was working at People Magazine when it was happening, and it was really hard to be a photo editor and seeing right. that side of the business, but also knowing this is shafting photographers left and right. Like you're taking away the relicensing ability and the resell sellability of that image. Like there's, there's a lot of problems with how copyright is being treated now, and I think that's where we really need to be fighting. And with... I don't know where we are right now with the copyright conversation, but I know it's in dangerous waters. So so we've got a question from one of our Facebook viewers uh, that just came in. And I'm going to actually open this up to both of you. Tom, I'd love to hear your perspectives okay. on this and also Alyssa. So this is from uh, Brian Aho, And he says, I haven't been on ASMP in a few months. However, are there links or information for photographers to find out avenues to go to if they find themselves in a situations where one may have been harassed? I'm assuming on a job site or an assisting role. Or even with a client. Well, that's, I mean, to me, that, you know, hearing about those kinds of episodes, obviously I want to bring that forward to our legal team and, you know, and have them look into the particulars of that kind of a situation. So we do have the legal resources that we typically apply to, you know, more generally right now, they're applied to contracts and releases and, you know, the typical legal problems that photographers experience. But, you know, certainly I think our umbrella is broad enough to, tackle those kinds of issues as well. I mean, it's definitely something to be addressed. It's just the, the manner of how, because I mean, even two months ago, I had a situation where I was the second assistant and the first assistant clearly had a problem with me, not because I was the second assistant, but because I was a woman and I was the second assistant. Um, and, you know, it was how to talk about it because you don't want to burn somebody else in the industry, but it's also like it's not okay to behave like that on set and, and scream at me because you're mad you carried my bag. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like there are, there are things that need to be handled better and I don't know how we go about addressing them, but it is something to Well, it brings to, to mind something about. that we've been working on. Actually, there's a, there's a really uh, amazing young woman who's a photographer, uh, and actually in my home chapter in Western New York, her name is Lindsay Sisting. And Lindsay's been heading up an assistance advocacy committee for mm -hmm. ASMP, and part of what she's helped identify from her experience is both on still sets, but also someone who works in commercials and motion pictures and works with other organizations like IATSE, is she's definitely um, been helpful in helping ASMP put together resources for those who may find themselves in unsafe or uncomfortable working conditions. So if anyone's out there that has had issues with that, I, I do urge you to contact ASMP and we can help put you in contact with someone like Lindsay who might be able to provide some resources on possible recourse or how to handle situations like that. I would say also that we've modified and, and uh, enlarged our code of ethics to reflect these kinds of issues and you know they're firmly addressed in our code of ethics and we expect all ASMP members at least to to uh, abide by those ethical codes and we you know are trying to circulate that I had a very interesting conversation recently by email with a woman who was uh, talking was going to be talking to a, a modeling you know a organization representing models and she wanted to know about our code of ethics and thought it was quite good and was going to be taking that forward as part of her presentation one thing that I kind of wanted to also talk about is what you think the nature of the relationship should be between YPA and educators. What I feel like that's an area where ASMP could also play kind of, for lack of a better way of saying it, a brokering or a connecting role between a YPA and educators. What have you experienced as a mentor in your role for, you know, YPA is coordinating that? I think that's definitely a critical thing because a lot of like I mean I don't know that many people that graduated with me that are still in photo like of the like 30 or 40 of us I know of three or four of us that are still doing it and I think it's kind of you get you get you know you get your diploma and they're like here you go out in the real world and you're totally on your own and I, I know I had one professor Renee Cradell but she was in the theater program if all educators were like her a lot more students wouldn't struggle about where to go and what to do. Like she was always being like, you should submit to this, you should apply for that, there's this great program. Like she was always providing those resources and connections to me, even though photo wasn't even her focus. She was a theater professor and she had a bunch of theater students that she needed to be focusing on, but she just cared so much about her students in general that she was doing whatever she could to help. And I think that's what a lot of educators need to think about doing a lot more. And, and 
following up and helping students figure out where to go afterwards because it seems like they're so focused on getting you through school that they're not really addressing the post, after. Post, yeah, post-graduation. So mm -hmm. as, as we wrap up, for those students that are interested in being involved in YPA and then for those photographers who are interested in possibly being mentors or donating to YPA to help support this great organization, where can people go to find out more information? So the Young Photographers Alliance, it's youngphotographersalliance.org, or you can go to the crowdfunding campaign that we're going to be launching next week, which is GoFundMe YPA 2018. Um, and we're basically just trying to raise some extra capital for the mentorship program because we, we have the cities and we're, you know, we're, we're, we're locking down our mentors. We have two sets of mentors already selected for New York, so we have two teams ready to go. Um, but we're trying to bring back a lot of the other programming we used to have too, hopefully. So we're trying to, to revamp the support. <laughs> Great. So in, in leaving our listeners with something, uh, we asked Doug Menue a question. I'm going to ask you the same thing. Um, if you had to give a single piece of advice to a photographer who was starting their career today, day one as a professional photographer, what would it be? What would you have wanted to hear? when you were starting out? There's, I, I'm going to do it a little differently. I would say uh, there's a it. book, and it ties back into the, the fear question, which is this book, Art and Fear. And it basically just reaffirms that it's OK if you're not succeeding as an artist right now. And it's OK if you're not doing it perfectly or if you're doing another job. Or, you know, it's saying it's basically just reemphasizing that as long as you're making art, you're an artist. And everything else kind of doesn't matter. You know, I mean, it matters. but. As long as you're focused on what you want to do and you're, you're making that art, it doesn't matter if it's perfect or the best or fabulous. You just need to work at it and not give up on it. <laughs> Great. Well, Lissa, thank you so much. Um, once again, uh, I'm Luke Copping. This is Tom Kennedy from ASMP. We're going to be back uh, in the future with more episodes uh, for you guys to check out. Thanks very much for tuning in today. And Melissa, thank you so much for being on with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And can I do, I, I made one mistake. I forgot one sponsor. Thank you. Oh, and yeah. I, go for photo it. Photo care. I, I, I told Fred I would thank him very heavily. I'm sorry. I have to for the project. He, he gave me the materials. So. Sorry. All right. Thank you.